we're supposed to do today. All right, so today everything's going to be over the complex numbers. And we're going to try to figure out the structure of heck algebras. So our, our goal is to understand the structure of the heck algebra, uh, I guess, better than we have so far. So if, let, let me recall heck operators. So this is something that we talked about two or three lectures ago. So let me just remind you what we did. Okay, so suppose that we have some modular form uh, for gamma 1, the full SL2Z of weight k. And we define this heck operator, Tn of f. It's a new modular form for gamma 1 of weight k. And if we think of f as a function of lattices, then this thing was, well, there was some normalizing factor we put in, n to the k minus 1. And then we summed over the sublattices of index n inside lambda of f of lambda prime. Right? And in fact, this same formula can be used to define uh, TNF if f is a modular form for something like gamma 0 n. At least if little n is prime to big n. So you just have to carry along the extra data. And we'll see a different way to talk about these hack operators later today that'll make this more evident. But for now, just know that that's true. Okay, so recall the few facts that we proved. Uh, so first of all, these Tn commute with each other. And I think last when we talked about this two or three lectures, lectures ago, I was just concentrating on the gamma 1 case. But everything is true for the gamma 0 n case as long as you make this restriction. Uh, if n and m are co-prime, then Tnm is Tn times Tm. Uh, you have this recurrence relation for uh, powers. So if you look at T of P to the n, that's T of P, T of the, T of P times, sorry, P sub P to the n plus 1 is Tp, Tp to the n, and then uh, minus p times p p to the n minus 1. And then you can compute how these things act on the q expansions. So if f is the sum from n equals 1 to infinity a n q to the n, suppose we're looking at a cusp form, so there's no a0, and p is prime, here p is prime too, then t p of f is given by this two expansion. Uh, so it's a n p plus p to the k minus 1 a n over p. n plus 1 here? Yes. <laughs> All right, so this is how it acts on q expansions. And uh, from this, you see that if you look at A1 of TPF, so I, I'm going to write like A1 of F to mean the, you know, the A1 and the expansion of F. So the, the first one here, well, here you have A, sub, so this is when n equals 1. Here you have AP, and then this is A1 over P, which by convention is 0. Right? So this is just AP of F. And in fact, this holds for composite n as well. So, I mean, this is, there, there's some general formula for Tnf. It's just a little more complicated, which is why I wrote the P1. So, in general, An of Tnf is An of f if n is co prime to n. So I'm going to let uh, T tilde be this 
kind of big formal ring of all HECA operators TP. Oh, yeah, yeah, A1. Thank you. Okay, so this is a polynomial ring in the TPs. P prime. <laughs> so it's a huge ring. And then I'm going to let T be the image of T, T tilde in the endomorphism ring of weight two cusp forms. All right, so we're basically, in this course, not going to use higher weight cusp forms. Everything's going to be weight two. And I'm going to write uh, S2n as the vector space of weight two cusp forms for gamma zero n. Do you have a question? Yeah. N over P. Then it's zero. It's a con by convention. All right, so T is the image of this big guy in this. Remember that S2N, we could identify this with uh, holomorphic one forms on X0N. So it's a finite dimensional space that mentions the genus of X0N. And so this is the image of that in there. And I'll write uh, T sub Q for the Q span of T and T sub C for the C span of T. Okay, so this S2n is some finite dimensional complex vector space, so this endomorphism ring is a finite dimensional complex vector space, and this is a complex subspace. So this is some nice finite dimensional algebra. We don't necessarily know anything nice about these things, right? I mean, it could be the case that S2 of n is one dimensional, and it could be the case that each TP is acting by a different transcendental number, right? There's no reason. Well, we'll see that that's not the case. Um, but for now, we don't actually know that these things behave as you'd want them to. Okay, so our goal is to understand this T. Are there any questions so far? Capital N is two or four. Why are you picking those numbers? Uh, X zero N has, uh, I think it has genus zero uh, for quite a while, at least up to ten. Yeah, but I mean, the the genus of X zero N is zero if N is like less than ten, I think. And so there's no cusp forms. For any of those ends. Yeah. Right, so this, this T that we're talking about is like the zero ring if n is too small. But as big n goes to infinity, the genus goes to infinity. So it gets mm. bigger and bigger. Mm. All right, so the first thing that's going to let us get some information uh, is the Peterson in our product. All right, so suppose we have two weight two cusp forms, which I'm going to think of as functions on the upper half plane that transform in a certain way. So we saw that if you look at the differential f of, dd, f of z dz, that this is actually invariant uh, under the group. That's because it's weight two. It just so happened that dz transformed like a weight minus two thing. And so it, uh, the same thing is true, of course, for g of z. And if I take this complex conjugate, it's still true. And so that means that if I take the wedge of these two one forms, I get an invariant two form. So this is just equal to f of z, g of z bar 
and then dz wedge dz bars 2i xy. So there's some constant t times i dx dy is an invariant to that. So that means I can integrate this over the quotient space. That's a well-defined thing. And that's what the center product is. Well, without the 2i. So you define definition of the center product so the integral over the upper half plane line from 0n z g z bar dx dy. Okay, so two kind of easy remarks. First of all, this integral converges. And that's because f and g are cusp forms, and these things vanish very fast at the cusps. g go to zero quickly at the cusps. Right, I mean, if you think of the Q expansion the, like at infinity, the first term is Q, which is e to the 2 pi i z. And so as z is going to, you know, its positive imaginary part is going to infinity that has exponential decay. So, I mean, if you think of the, like, fundamental domain for SL2z, it's something like this. And a cusp form, I mean, if you were integrating over this, the only hard part is to worry about what happens as you go up to infinity here. And cusp forms are going to decay very fast there. Uh, and the second thing is, well, okay, so that makes it well defined. And then it's obvious that this thing is a positive definite Hermitian in a product. And its importance comes from the following proposition, which I'm not going to prove, but it's, it's just a little calculation. And that's that TP is self adjoint. That if you have two, two of these guys in S2n, then TPF paired with G is F paired with TPG. So these TP form a family of commuting self-adjoint operators on this finite dimensional space, and that means that they can be simultaneously diagonalized. So you can pick a basis, so corollary, there exists a basis of S2n consisting of simultaneous eigenforms. And that implies that this TC is semi-simple as an algebra, which just means that it's a product of a finite number of copies of C. OK, so these simultaneous eigenvectors are important, so we give them a name. They're called Hecke eigenforms. form is some, well, for us, a weight two cusp form on gamma zero n, uh, which is an eigenvector for all the TPs. And of course, we're only considering P not, not, not dividing n. When we say that F is normalized. leading coefficient is one.
turns out the leading coefficient is never zero, so you can always normalize an eigenform. So you have a basis of normalized eigenforms. All right, so if, if f is an eigenform, then you get a homomorphism alpha from this hack algebra to C, and it's defined by taking Tp to the eigenvalue of Tp on f. This is a C algebra homomorphism. And such an alpha, what we call a system of, system of eigenvalues. All right, so it follows just from kind of formal considerations that uh, this S2n, you can decompose it as a direct sum over the systems of eigenvalues of what I'll call S2n alpha, where that's the space of things that transform under T by alpha. So this is the set of Fs such that Tf equals alpha of Tf for all T and P. And the ring itself, Tc, decomposes as a product over these alphas of Cs. And this C acts on, you know, the one here acts on this one, zero on the other ones. All right, so the next thing to say is the multiplicity one theorem. So that's going to say that each one of these spaces here is one dimensional. But I'm going to phrase it differently first. So, all right. So here's here's the theorem. Suppose that our capital N is prime. And suppose that we have two normalized eigenforms. such that their eigenvalues agree for all p. The tp eigenvalue of f equals the tp eigenvalue of g for all primes p not equal to n. The statement then is that f and g are equal. this. So first I want to introduce a little piece of notation that's convenient. Uh, so notation. Suppose that we have some matrix A, B, C, D in SL2R and F is a function on the upper half plane. Well, maybe you'll say H is a function on the upper half plane. Uh, then I'm going to define this slash notation that's used. So it's a, h slash bracket gamma. So this is going to be a new function on the upper half plane. And its value at z is given by cz plus d to the minus 2 f of gamma z. And so the important fact that you can check is that this defines a group action of SL2R on the space of functions. And furthermore, this is chosen so that uh, you know, F is a, I mean, the, this is chosen precisely so that the invariance properties of a weight too modular form correspond being fixed under this action. So f is a weight to cusp form if and only if f with this bracket thing is fixed for all gamma and gamma zero n and the holomorphicity conditions are satisfied. So holomorphic conditions and vanishing. 
The point is that tr the transformation law corresponds to being fixed. Okay, so we have our f and g's that have this property. Now, if you remember the formula that I wrote down at the beginning, it said that uh, a1 of tpf is ap of f, right? This just holds true generally. And so if, if f is an eigenform, so if tpf equals alpha f, then this thing here is a1 of f times alpha. And if f is normalized, then a1 of f is 1. So this is alpha. So if f is normalized, which we're assuming, then uh, a p of f is the eigenvalue of t p f, of t p on f. OK, so for these two forms f and g, we have a p of f is equal to the eigenvalue of t p on f. And we're assuming that's equal to the eigenvalue of t p on g. And that's equal to a p g. So a p f equals a p g for all p not equal to n. And so by the multiplicativity properties of the Heck operators and these recurrence relations, this implies that a n f, a n f is equal to a n g for all n co-prime to n. So now let's look at the difference between f and g. Then, I mean, this thing here is saying that all these a n's of h vanish, right? So a n of h equals zero unless big n divides h. Right? Big n divides little n. So in other words, h is some sum like this. I can write it, I guess, like this. So you only get Q to the capital N's showing up. And so that means that H has an additional invariance. So H is invariant. So if we do H of Z plus 1 over N, right, then up here, I mean, this is E to the 2 pi I Z. Right? So when I add 1 over N, since I always have a capital N up here, that's always going to be an integer. And this is going to always be invariant. And so this shows that h is invariant under this slash thing. Well, if gamma is in gamma 0 n, right, because we're assuming that it's a modular form for gamma 0 n, but this also shows that it holds when gamma is this matrix 1, 1 over n, 1. Right, because the linear fractional transformation corresponding to this is z plus 1 over n, and the cz plus d here is just 1. OK, so uh, let sigma be the matrix N1. Make sure I have this right. And define H prime to be H slashed with sigma inverse. OK, so then. Uh, H prime is invariant if gamma is, you know, the sigma conjugate of one of these things. So if gamma is in sigma, sigma gamma zero n, sigma inverse, 
or gamma equals sigma n1 sigma inverse. Oh, sorry, 1, 1 over n. In this matrix, if you multiply it out, right, I'm multiplying by n1 on the left, that clears this, and then the other thing doesn't really do anything. This is just matrix 1, 1, 1. And this sigma gamma 0 n guy, if you look at it, this is the set of matrices A, B, C, D in SL2Z, such that B is 0 mod n. So it's the kind of upper triangular version of gamma 0 n. But this matrix, together with these, that lower triangular version of gamma 0 n, generate the full gamma 1. So in other words, this H prime is invariant under the full modular group. And it has the correct properties at the cusps. So that means it's in S21. And that's zero. So H prime is zero. So H is zero. So F equals zero. Any questions about this? Uh, yeah, I suppose that's okay here. So let me make two remarks about this theorem. So the first, first remark is that the stronger version holds. So if, again, we have f and g as before, if the TP eigenvalues of f and g agree for all but finitely many p, or even just p in a density one set. Then f and g are equal. And I think we'll actually prove this later on as a consequence of some other stuff that we're doing. So this is called strong multiplicity one. Uh, and the second remark so I, when I stated the theorem, I stated it for capital N being prime. Yeah. Well, like Dirichlet density. I mean, whatever you need for Chebotaro's theorem. <laughs> um, right, and the second, yeah, second thing is, I, so I, the theorem that we proved, I said, let N be prime, and then we got this thing. And it's actually false if N is not prime. But it's false for kind of a silly reason. So here's why. Suppose P divides N. Okay, suppose and suppose that F is a an S2N for N over P. It's false in general if N is composite. Sometimes it's true. Okay, so suppose that you can find P dividing N and you have some thing of level N over P. Uh, then both f of z and f of pz are in s to n. And furthermore, these things have the same eigenvalues. Same, I'll say, tl eigenvalues for all l not dividing n. That would be a contradiction to the statement of the theorem. But this is really the only thing that goes wrong. A nice way to fix this. So you can define what's called the old subspace 
as to an old to be the span of things like this. So the span of fz, fpz for f in s2 and over p and p dividing n. And then you can define the new, sub new subspace to be the orthogonal complement of the old one. And then multiplicity one holds in the new space. So we're not, I think, going to actually need these concepts, but I thought it was worth saying, because that's kind of the natural way it generalizes. So these old forms, you should think of, they're kind of like the analog of non-primitive Dirichlet characters, kind of things that you already saw, and you're just seeing them again in a stupid way. All right, are there any questions about this? OK, so this multiplicity one theorem we proved has some corollaries. Uh, so, so first is what I kind of said before. So for all systems of eigenvalues, uh, this S2 alpha space is one-dimensional. That's just a restatement of the theorem. corollary is that there's a bijection between homomorphisms in the Heck algebra to C and normalized eigenforms. Right, if you remember this T decomposes a product of copies of C over each system of eigenforms each system of eigenvalues. So each one picks out some, each homomorphism like this is some alpha, and you get a unique normalized eigenform corresponding to it. And another corollary is that uh, the space of cusp forms is free of rank one as a QC module. Now I want to talk about uh, a different way of looking at the Heck operators in terms of correspondences. So these are called Hecke correspondences. So okay, remember that TPF, if we think in terms of lattices, this was the sum over sublattices of the given index, like this. And now if lambda, if we think of that as corresponding to an elliptic curve, then there's lambda prime. Oh, if I'm using sublattices, well anyway, I mean, sublattice corresponds to a degree p isogeny. I think I'm going to flip the order here. So this corresponds to a degree p isogeny. And this is closely related to our gamma zero p structures. So if you remember, uh, I mean, we defined x zero of n. Let me just use p for the moment. So x zero of p was defined as the set of elliptic curves of the subgroup G, right? G is a order p group. But giving an order p subgroup is the same thing as giving an isogeny of degree p. So, the, 
correspondence is, I mean, if you have g, then phi would be the map from e to e mod g. And if you have phi, then g is the kernel of phi. That's how you go back and forth. So instead, I can think of x0, p as the moduli, spaces, moduli space of degree p isogenies. And I'm going to think of x0 np as the space of things that look like an isogeny of degree p, and then some gamma 0 n structure floating around. And I can, if p and n are prime, which I'm assuming, then I can break up the structures like that. So degree c is p, and this g is a cyclic order n subgroup. OK? Yeah. I mean, it's up to isomorphism of the whole data. So, I mean, it should be, we're working over C, so it's isomorphism classes of isogenies, so we have to be an isomorphism from E to E, E to E, E1 to yeah. E2, E prime. Right, right. Yeah, so that everything commutes. Okay, so I can look at this diagram now. <laughs> so in terms of data like this, these maps are defined like this. So E takes something like this. So I have a degree P isogeny and an order and subgroup of E. And it just forgets the isogeny. And P2 just takes E prime and the image of G. And note here, I mean, I should have said this clearly P and N are co prime. So this phi is a degree P isogeny, it induces an isomorphism on N torsion. So this image of phi of G is still a cyclic group of order N. So that defines these maps like this. So if I have some, if I start with some EG over here, then its inverse image under P1 is, I mean, it's the set of all isogenies from E, just with the extra data carried along. So that looks like the thing that I'm summing over when I do the HECA operator, right? I'm supposed to sum over all isogenies from E and just carry the extra data along. Don't worry about the G. So the, the inverse image of the thing down here is the set that I want to sum over. So if I have some like function here, and if I pull it back to here, and then push forward, push forward means sum over all the values, that's going to be doing exactly what the HECA operator does. So it's just summing over all the isogenies of the correct size. So this thing here is called the Hecke correspondence. But what I just said, it's kind of the geometric way to think of these Hecke operators. I mean, okay, well, I'll say more in a second. So let me make a few general remarks about correspondences. So in general, a, a correspondence is a diagram like that. So a correspondence, let me call it f from x to x, so I'm going to use this dashed thing to mean that it's a correspondence. So it's a diagram where you put x here and x here and some y up here. We call them p1 and p2 still. 
And so I'm going to. Hmm? So I'm going to assume for this discussion that x and y are smooth projective curves, and that these two maps are finite maps. So an example of a correspondence, you can think of any function as a correspondence. So any function f from x to x can be thought of as a correspondence. By taking y to be x, p1 to be the identity, and p2 to be the f. And then generally, you should think of correspondences as some way to think about multi-valued functions. So correspondence is approximately equal to the multi-valued function. You can build a multi-valued function by sending a point x to the image under p2 of the inverse image under p1 of x. So that's one way to think about these things. All right, so if you have a correspondence, you can do some things with it. I mean, lots of cohomology groups are functorial with respect to correspondences. So a correspondence F induces a map on singular global cohomology. And it's defined by the formula uh, pull back under P1 and push forward under P2. Okay, so here at P1 upper star is just the usual pullback on cohomology. And this P2 lower star is kind of going the wrong way from what you expect. Right, cohomology is contragrained, so in general you don't have a P2 lower star like this. But in the situation that we're in, you have Poincaré duality, which says that this upper H1 is the same as this lower H1. And so you have a P2 lower star on that. That's always the case. And so this lower star on cohomology is just defined by that. So F also induces a map on uh, forms. So H0 of x omega 1 to H0 x omega 1 by the same formula. So P2 lower star, P1 upper star. And so again, you can always pull back a form. You can't always push forward a form. But the way that push forward to the forms work in this case, I mean, if you think about a form upstairs on Y, you have this map. And if you, at least you're, if you're away from a ramification point, then this map is going to induce isomorphisms on all the tangent spaces. So if you have a tangent vector downstairs, you can move it to a tangent vector on all the points upstairs and sum up the values of the form there. And that's how you can build the form downstairs. <coughs> and so a fact is that, so we have this stuff going on on singular cohomology and on forms, and this is compatible with Hodge theory. So the action of the correspondence F is compatible with the Hodge theory isomorphism. And so that, that's the isomorphism that takes the first singular cohomology group of X, tends it up with C uh, to H0, X omega 1, directs on its conjugate space.
And one more thing that correspondences act on is divisors. And it's again by pullback push forward. So explicitly what that means in this case is if you have some point on x, then that action of f on it, maybe I'll call that f star of x, action of the correspondence on this divisor, you sum over the inverse image of x, so over those points y, so that p1 y is equal to x, then you take p2 of y, and you take that divisor. And so this induces a map on the Jacobian. an actual endomorphism of the Jacobian. So a correspondence on the curve gives you an actual endomorphism of the Jacobian. And uh, you can also express this as P1 upper star composed of P2 upper star dual. So these upper stars, the natural maps on the Jacobian backwards, and that dual is the dual isogeny. OK, any questions? Yeah. I mean, that's going to induce like the dual isogeny on the Jacobian. What did you want to know? It's it's F composed of the dual. I think that it's at least correct some of the time. I don't remember the general statement yet. I know that's at least correct for Frobenius in characteristic P, but I don't remember if it works generally. Yeah. find a ring of correspondences. Uh, but I think they should, I mean, if you define it correctly, I think they should be the same. I mean, the ring of correspondences should be some kind of endomorphism of like the motive. It should be like the endomorphisms in the category of motives or something. With the curves, they should just be the same as their motive. So that's, anyway, let's go back to heck operators. Okay, so we have our big Hecke algebra, and now thinking about them as you know, given by these correspondences, we get actions on all these different spaces. We can look at the first singular cohomology of the modular curve with z coefficients. We still have actions on the space of cusp forms, which I'm going to think of as the h0 of the modular curve with omega 1 coefficients. And on the dual space of that, and then we have this Hodge theory thing, which is compatible with these actions. So now if, if you have some T in this formal Hecke ring, and it acts by zero on S2n, then it necessarily acts by zero in the conjugate space as well. And so it acts by zero on this H1. Because of this isomorphism. And so that implies that the image of this T tilde in the endomorphism ring of this H1 was just that T that we had before, same as the image in here.
Or you could say this another way by saying that our t acting here actually preserves this integral thing that we're getting. And you can take the image of the integral cohomology in this complex space, and T is actually going to preserve it by, by these compatibilities. And so that tells us some things. So from that, we see that T is a finite rank free Z module. Right? Because it's a sub of the endomorphism algebra of this, this guy, which is Z to the 2G. And it also tells us that, I mean, like TC we defined as the C span in here of T, but since T is preserving some integral thing, that's just going to be T tensored up with C because we have that fact. Okay, so one corollary of this is that the Hecke eigenvalues of an eigenform are algebraic integers. Right? And the reason for that is that the eigenvalues are given by homomorphism from T to C. And so you have a finite rank Z ring mapping to C, the image is going to be algebraic integers. And another corollary is that uh, so this TQ is a finite dimensional Q algebra. And we know that when we tensor up to C, we get this TC, which is semi simple. So that means that this TQ doesn't have any nilpotents because it sits inside TC, which doesn't have any nilpotents. So that means that TQ is semi simple. And if you have a finite dimensional semi simple Q algebra, it's of a particular form. It's a product of number fields. All right, so that tells us quite a bit about the heck algebra, at least over Q. All right, one more thing is the following. So we know that S2n is a free rank 1 TC module, we proved that. And so it follows that the same is true for S2n bar. And so the direct sum is a free rank 2 T module. But this thing we know is isomorphic to the singular cohomology tensored up with C. So I'm going to write that as H0, X0, N with Q coefficients tensored over Q up to C. So we have this nice ring TQ. It's a finite dimensional semi-simple Q algebra. And this H1 is a TQ module. And it's free of rank 2 when you tensor up to C. And if you just think about what the structure of modules are, that says that it already has to be free of rank 2. Okay, are there any questions about this? Okay, so I want to say now, I guess I'll say like where this is kind of going, what we're going to talk about next time. And then there's one more little thing that I want to talk about today after this. So this TQ, since the Ts are acting by isogenies, uh, sorry, by correspondences, they induce isogenies, or sorry, endomorphisms of the Jacobian. So 
the Seca algebra actually sits inside the endomorphism ring of the Jacobian. And so if I tensor up to Q, this TQ decomposes as these KIs, and that gives me a decomposition of the Jacobian up to isogeny. So we can decompose J0n as some product of J0ni's in the isogeny category. Where this, sorry, J0n i on the outside, where this guy here corresponds to ki inside TQ. And precisely what I mean is that ki is given by the projection of some idempotent. And so you can just, you know, clear denominators and make that an integral thing and then apply that to the Jacobian. I just mean that Ki is Ei TQ. Ei and TQ is an item potent. Right? And this J0Ni is just going to be Ei applied to J0N. I'm oh, sorry. So pick N and pick K and Z so that K times Ei lives in the integral thing. Right? You can do that because this is a finite rank Z module sitting inside this finite Q vector space. So you can clear denominators. And then I can look at KEI applied to J0N, right? The, the image, I mean, the, this, this is some endomorphism of the Jacobian. So I can take its image, right? And this is what I'm calling J0NI. Um, and it's independent of the choice of K up to isogeny. isogeny. So there's a better way to do this that gives you something more canonical, but if you just worry about up to isogeny, this is a fine way to do it. Okay? Yeah, yeah, I mean that in the isogeny category. I mean, I'm thinking about this, I mean, J0n, the, the isogeny category is a semi-simple abelian category. And this J0n is some object in it, and its endomorphism ring has this product of fields, so there's a corresponding decomposition of the object. It's just a general fact. And so, I mean, the you know, formation of cohomology kind of goes through this sort of thing. So the cohomology of this J0NI, which if I'm thinking up to isogeny sort of only makes sense as a Q-vector space, is a free, is a two-dimensional Ki vector space. And so that implies that its Tate module, if I look at, say, TL of J0NI, is a rank 2 module over this Ki tensored with QL. And this thing may not be a field anymore, right? It could split up into a bunch of l adic fields. If I pick some place of Ki over L, so pick place lambda Ki over L, and that means that's the same thing as picking a, you know, a field occurring in this decomposition, then I can look at sort of this TL of J0NI tensored over Ki with this completion. Find that a completion of this field. Maybe I'll call that K sub i lambda. And this is a two-dimensional K i lambda vector space. I mean, just think about the case where K i is the rational numbers to make it less confusing. And that, that occurs quite often. So K i is the rational numbers. Lambda is just L. So this, this thing here is just Q L. So in, in that situation, this is a two-dimensional Q L vector space. And I guess when I was forming this, I had in mind working over the complex numbers, because that's all we've been talking about today. But in fact, you know that this Jacobian is defined over the rational numbers, because it's the modular curve is defined over the rational numbers. And these Hecke correspondences make sense over the rational numbers. So I can think about everything being defined over Q, and then take this Tate module over Q bar. And the action of GQ will commute with everything. And so it'll just go through this construction. So this is going to have a GQ action on it.
And so we've associated to this choice of ki, which is really the same thing as giving a homomorphism from t to ki, which is the, more or less the same thing as giving a heck eigenform. And if it were actually q, then it would be giving a heck eigenform with q coefficients. For a general field, it's like giving some Galois orbit of eigenforms, but whatever. So given some modular form, we've constructed this Galois representation. And this is con construction due to Shimura. So next time what we want to do is analyze this Galois representation. And we're going to see what the traces of Frobenius are in terms of the heck eigenvalues. That's the main goal. This is like the first instance of non-abelian class field theory. Are there any questions about that? Okay, there's still a few minutes left today, and I want to... I should define the act and Leonard involution because it's going to come up at some point. Uh, I may as well just do it now. Okay, so Atkin and Leonard involution. Okay, so this is going to start off as an involution of the space X0n called W. And it's defined, you can think of it in two ways. I mean, you can think of X0n in two ways, as isogenies or as things with a subgroup. So if you think of X0n as the space of isogenies of degree P, or degree N, rather, cyclic isogenies of degree N, then W takes this to the dual isogeny. And if you want to think in terms of elliptic curves with a subgroup, pair E G, the new elliptic curve is the quotient E mod G, and the new subgroup is the image of the full N torsion N E mod G. And so it's clear from the first description that it's an isogeny if you do it twice, uh, an involution. If you do it twice, you get the same thing. And that's also it's not hard to see from this description either. Okay, so you can pull back differential forms on X0n by this map, and so that gives you some uh, action on cusp forms. And in terms of uh, functions on the upper half plane, there's a formula for it. So Wf is the function on the upper half plane given by f of minus 1 over nz. And there might be some factor here. There might be an n there or something that I'm forgetting. I don't remember. It's confusing. There's two versions that people talk about. OK, let's not worry about that. And so you, you can show that this commutes with the action of the heck operators. And so that means that it's going to preserve these eigenspaces. say about that, but I just wanted to define it now, so when I want to use it later, I don't have to do that. Uh, are there any questions? Well, that's all for today. It's early again.